I would like now to invite to the floor our keynote speaker, Sir Dieter Helm. Good morning. Good morning, Dieter. So, uh, Dieter Helm is a professor of economic policy at the University of Oxford, and in 2021 um, was awarded a knighthood for service to the environment, energy, and utility qualities. Uh, Dieter, you have written many fabulous books. I uh, have read most of them. Uh, the one that I haven't read yet is the Net Zero, which is a book that we highly recommend as a Christmas gift and also beyond Christmas. It's a book I think everybody who is interested in sustainable aviation should have. Uh, so in that book, you address the actions that we need to take to tackle the climate emergency. But I'm sure we will hear more of those views today in your keynote uh, speech, Dieter. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I would like to uh, try to frame uh, what I'm going to say into three parts. A first part is, and you might think this is rather surprising, uh, is to actually define what climate change is, because it isn't the same as net zero. And it's only by thinking quite hard about what is actually causing climate change, then one can start to think about what kind of policies might be required. So I'm gonna say some surprising things there, I think, which jar with the current policy approaches, COP26 and so on. So the, the second thing I want to do is then turn to uh, net zero uh, policies themselves and what they mean and what they don't mean and uh, the extent to which they should be uh, wound out to include uh, international dimensions. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about aviation. And uh, Peter said earlier that I don't say much about aviation. There is one good reason for that, which is that climate change is not about each particular unique sector. Climate change is caused by carbon uh, concentration in the atmosphere. And it doesn't matter who, which industry or where that carbon is emitted. So the idea that you're going to have a climate change policy, which has a specialist uh, niche for each and every particular activity in the economy, is a recipe for um, uh, failure. So I'll come back to that point, but I'm going to say some very uh, particular things about where, uh, where aviation fits into this frame a bit later on. But I say, let me start at the beginning. Okay, so climate change, I'm sure you all know this, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, reinvent anything, is the consequence of the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is caused by the concentrations of carbon and other gases in the atmosphere. So the only number that matters from a climate change perspective is what's happening to the concentration of carbon and carbon equivalents in the atmosphere and the carbon equivalents for a, um, uh, an umbrella to include all those other pollutants, uh, some of which come from aviation as well as the carbon. So if you want to ask a simple question, well, how's it going? How are we getting on? Are we, are we making progress? You know, we've been at this since 1990 uh, or the framework convention in 92. So we've had a, a good 30 years at this game and enormous amount of effort has been put into this, uh, speeches, political capital, um, you know, 25 and now 26 COP meetings to deal with this, thousands of people uh, flying generally um, to various locations around the world to uh, beat their brows and tell us all the things they're gonna do about climate change. How's it going? And the answer is very badly. Since 1990, every single year, Without exception, we've added two parts per million to the carbon in the atmosphere. Now you'd let to have that, you need to allow that to sink in every single year. So you might think, well, you know, we know what we've got to do, we've got to cut emissions. You know, last year was a fantastic controlled experiment. Okay, so emissions were slashed during the lockdown. And nobody envisages a COP process, national um, uh, NDCs, et cetera, which would have produced emissions reductions as quickly as last year because of the pandemic, the lockdown. Okay. So what happened last year? The carbon concentration in the atmosphere went up two parts per million. 
you might think, well, what about the financial crash in 2007, 2008? You know, that was a huge world event. Surely that slowed down um, uh, 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 our um, causing of climate change. No, two parts per million. And what's happening this year? Two parts per million. So my starting point is, and I'm deadly serious about climate change, anyone who thinks that one more heave of the current policies, you know, we couldn't fix it at, at Paris, so I tell you what, we'll fix it in Glasgow. No, no, we'll fix it in Egypt, and everyone can fly out to the uh, tourist resorts in Egypt to discuss this. No, it's not going to work. It hasn't worked so far, and it won't work going forward, and I'll explain that uh, moving forward. And I say that not as a sort of pessimist or whatever. It's simply the facts. That's the case. It is the case that we have increased emissions every single year for what I call the last 30 wasted years. Now, the inquiring mind would ask, how could that possibly be the case? How could all that political and economic effort, um, political capital, uh, all those meetings, uh, and indeed, even those emissions reductions last year, not make a dent in the problem. And the answer is that the problem is not just emissions. So the carbon concentration in the atmosphere is the outcome of two things, emissions, yes, and sequestration. So the reason we have the broadly equitable climate, which makes this planet perhaps not uniquely, there may be some planet somewhere out in the outer universe which has similar conditions, but pretty uniquely livable for us humans is that the natural environment soaks up carbon at, at, the, at the same time as the natural environment emits carbon. And carbon is absolutely essential. You and I are made of carbon. Right? This, this world can't work without carbon, but a balance is struck and it varies a bit over geological time between sequestration and emissions. But everybody focus on emissions. Well, what about sequestration? Soil has four times roughly, three to four times the carbon of the atmosphere. That's the great carbon sink, the soils. What's going on there? Should be sucking up more carbon. No, agriculture is 25% of global emissions, not the great sequestrator, which it should be. What's happening to our oceans? What's happening to our shores? What's happening to our uh, Amazons and our rainforests? This is every bit as important as what's happening to emissions out of the back of a, an aircraft flying around the world. So you need to take a view about policies uh, if you want to address climate change, which are going to, first of all, stop the increase of carbon into the atmosphere, and then secondly, start to wind it down. And that requires thinking very hard about both sides of the equation, not one, because focusing just on one won't get you there. That's the first point to say. The second point to say, which follows from this, is that what really matters for climate change is that carbon, and it doesn't matter where the carbon is emitted. So if, as the COP structures do, as the EU is doing, as the UK is doing, as now the US is doing, countries set themselves net zero targets, you have to ask the question, right, what is it that they're actually trying to measure? And it turns out that what they're measuring is net, to get to net zero, is carbon production on a territorial basis. And I've often wondered when I listen to our prime minister and others tell the world what a fantastic example the UK is in tackling climate change, whether it's true or whether it's smoke and mirrors. And the answer is a lot, lot of the latter. So let me put it simply. If in the UK we wanted to uh, reduce our territorial uh, carbon emissions really quickly, I can give you a very simple recipe. All you need to do to make a big dent is close the rest of the steel industry, close the six petrochemical plants in the UK, close down the car industry if Brexit doesn't finish it off anyway, and take out that fertilizer factory which couldn't produce the CO2 which we needed for food, et cetera, recently. In other words, just close down your energy intensive industries and import the stuff instead. 
So get the steel from China instead of from Port Talbot or Scunthorpe or wherever it's made in the UK. And you know, that's what's been going on in Europe and the UK. The reason why the EU and once, once upon a time, the UK as a member of the EU can do so well in leading the world on these COP processes from Kyoto onwards is because broadly, in an in historical sense, they're deindustrializing. So it's no accident that China has 30% of world emissions and Europe and the UK look like they're doing pretty well getting these emissions down. A lot of this is displacement. And that displacement doesn't do anything to help reduce climate change. In fact, you could pursue a territorial carbon production target and have the result that you made climate change worse because that steel could be more polluting in carbon terms produced in China than it is in the UK or in the Ruhr uh, or, or somewhere in, in Europe. Now this really matters because what it tells you is if any country unilaterally wants to make the claim that it is no longer going to cause climate change when it gets net, net zero, which is what our climate change committee here claims, and many European politicians claim, then they have to focus on carbon consumption, not carbon territorial production, which is the framework of the COPs. And uh, that means that they need to apply the same carbon policies, and in, particularly, and in particular carbon pricing to imports as related as the same as domestic production. It's carbon footprints that count, not where it happens territorial, territorially that particular emissions are produced. And it matters in that carbon footprint what the sequestration is as well as the emissions. Now I've labored those points because they frame where we've got to. So there is pretty much no hope and I say this not as a pessimist, but as a realist, that the COP framework is going to actually crack climate change. I wish I could say to the contrary, but it isn't, and it hasn't. Not only has it failed for the last 30 years, but if you look forward through the next 50 years, the outcome at Glasgow tells you in amazing clarity how it's going to go. So the first thing to say is that if all the NDCs for emissions, nothing to do with sequestration yet, just for emissions are added up, it's 2.4 degrees. Nobody's ever uh, uh, come close to the, a, a, a circumstance when all the NDCs are being met. So we are going to get well over two degrees warming from the best outcome from Glasgow, okay? But of course, as with that example last year, that the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere went up while the emissions themselves fell in the lockdowns. Once you put the sequestration side into the picture, it's a lot worse because we are merrily destroying the capacity around the globe for the natural world to absorb carbon. It's not just we're wiping out the biodiversity, we are burning down the rainforest. We are planting palm oil uh, um, uh, plantations, etc. And they're not for the Brazilians, or the Indonesians, they're for us because we buy the products. You know, if uh, bits of the Amazon are cleared to raise beef and we import that beef, we are the ultimate people responsible for the destruction of that Amazon because we are the consumers. It's our carbon consumption, which is the result of the carbon production that takes place in the Amazon. Think about the fact that the Amazon is a net emitter of carbon. I find that the most frightening fact in the last year that's come to light. Now, you might say, oh, well, you know, at COP, they all agreed to do this to address deforestation. No, not really. First of all, they decided that it wouldn't be stopped until 2.30. So if you're a country that's hell bent on burning down your rainforest for domestic economic reasons, get on with it fast. And interestingly, this last year has had the highest rate of burning in the Amazon uh, yet. Secondly, we proposed, as we did back in 2014, it's exactly the same, uh, that 14 billion will be spent, uh, half private, half public, on protecting the rainforests. 14 billion is 
It's not an insignificant number, but it's quite a lot less than the UK wasted on its test and trace scheme to address the coronavirus. Ah, oh, but you might say, yeah, but we're going to give 100 billion per year to developing countries to help them achieve net zero. Really? That's a big number. Well, that's what we agreed at Paris, and we delivered about 75 billion, but much of it is by reassigning aid budgets. So again, quite a lot of smoke and mirrors. Let this fact sink in. What is actually happening to help the developed world decarbonize is a number which is roughly equivalent to the annual dividend of Saudi Aramco. That I think puts in perspective the lack of any willingness of the developed countries to help the developing countries. And you might say, well, that's their problem, the developing countries. No, climate change will be determined in China, India, and sub-Saharan Africa, overwhelmingly, and also Brazil and a few other places too. What happens in Europe and what happens in the UK will make very little difference to climate change. What we have to do is see how countries can develop all those airports, all those aviation, all that kind of stuff, and do it in a low carbon way. And Glasgow tells you how seriously these countries take it. So China intends to carry on increasing its emissions. It's already nearly 30% of total world uh, emissions until 230. Well, I, I think actually China might economically have fantastic difficulties in the next few years. But if it was to continue at say five to 6% growth per year, by the time that China starts to peak its emissions, it will be twice its current economic size. 7% <clears throat> per annum leads to a doubling of the size of an economy every uh, 10 years. And it doesn't propose to get to <clears throat> whatever it means by carbon neutrality until 260, right? That's 40 years time. But put that aside, India doesn't propose to get to net zero for half a century until two. Six, 270, 50 years onwards from where we are. And as for sub-Saharan Africa, and remember the population of Nigeria is probably going to be equal or bigger than the whole population of Europe by the second half of this century. There really are no serious, credibly binding uh, targets which look like being achieved. So that doesn't work either. So if we are serious about helping developing countries, Glasgow doesn't add up. So I say this again as facts, because you have to start from the baseline that we've actually got, and not the one that all the demonstrators and all those people having a, a hyped up uh, uh, session in Glasgow thought they were achieving. Now, I started off by saying, and I continue, not only will this not do, it's got to be turned around. The reason it's got to be turned around is because it's not sustainable. And if you say to people, is two, three, four degrees warming sustainable? They all tend to agree, no, of course that's not sustainable. Right? Then you follow it up with the killer point. Then it won't be sustained. You'll be living with three, four percent, two, three, four percent global warming and all the consequences that follow. And it's no good telling the populations, you know, like uh, the British Prime Minister tells us, uh, uh, Nick Stern tells us, the Climate Change Committee here tells us, the Europeans tell us that, you know, oh, well, we should bear the costs of mitigation, of reducing emissions, because those costs are much lower than the costs of climate change itself. As if we in Little England, uh, now cast aside from uh, even Europe in our Brexit world, if we get our emissions to net zero on a territorial basis, somehow we're going to avoid the costs of climate change. It's obviously not true. We're going to pay both sets of costs, the costs of emissions reductions and the cost of the climate change for which uh, Glasgow and the next one at Egypt, you know, we get to 27, 28, we'd have 30 cops one day and have a celebration for that, no doubt. These are not going to get us there. So the hard reality is that the cost to Europeans, UK, US, et cetera, are likely to be both the costs of mitigation and the costs of climate change. And that's an enormous challenge for any politician to sell to people. But if you think that that politically can't be done, uh, and you think that there's 
no chance of doing much about it. You know, this idea that aviation can't really do anything for another decade, right? If you think these things can't be done, then you really have to think about uh, what the world's going to look like going forward. And a crucial point of the way I look at this is to think, what is the political reaction function? So as it turns out that we're not achieving what people pretended we were achieving at Glasgow, as it turns out um, to be the case that the concentration of carbon keeps marching up, what will the politicians do? Will they say it isn't going to work, so we shouldn't try? Or will they double down on all the targets that they put in place? And in particular, what will the commission do? And I'm, of course, interested in what the British government will do, though it's a much smaller player in all of this uh, frame. And that's a big question for everyone in the aviation industry, because the question is whether, in effect, politicians are going to turn a blind eye to what's going on, or they're going to double down and say, we have to do something substantive about this. Now, that's gloomy in the sense that the facts tell us a gloomy story. And those facts always open to challenge. I'll change my mind about any of those. If you tell me there's a new measure that shows that uh, carbon sequestration in the Amazon is accelerating, or you tell me that uh, parts per million have been mismeasured, fine. But for the moment, that's the basis we work forward on. So now we turn to aviation and uh, what Peter calls the neglected bit of my book. Well, if we take a carbon consumption view of aviation, we start off with the observation that it's not the airlines, the polluters, it's not the aircraft, the polluters, it's not the airports, it's you and me that go on those planes, though I no longer do go on planes. We, the public, demand the services of the aviation sector to take us to our holiday destinations, to take us to our business locations, to do all that uh, uh, travel and transport around the globe. So it's no good saying, uh, you know, it's like in the, in, in, in the demonstration, use these nasty oil companies that cause all the pollution. No, we, the public, fill up our cars with their product. We use the petrochemicals, we use the plastics. So there's no evading the responsibility in a carbon consumption frame that it's us as consumers that are the ultimate polluters, not the producers who produce for us, the consumers. So the next thing to say is that in a sustainable economy, a world in which we have um, uh, brought climate change under control and stopped the devastation to biodiversity, that economy, if it was efficient, would incorporate all the pollution costs. Not to price pollution is to go for inefficiency. And not to, uh, to price imports, but just to price domestic production, is a pollution subsidy to countries that are the source of those imports. By having, for example, in the UK, a carbon price, which is amongst the highest in the world, 70 pound UK ETS plus about uh, 20 pound uh, carbon floor price. That's essentially a 70 or 90 pound subsidy to Chinese steel producers as against UK production. This can't go on, okay? Um, uh, as a frame, if you seriously want to address climate change. So you put in place carbon prices. You can do it by standards, you can do it by regulation, but all of these things have an implicit carbon price embedded in them. And you put that price in place. And when it comes to aviation, aviation's carbon footprint is much more than what comes out of the engine at the back of the, or on the side of the plane. And you can see, I know nothing about the technologies of aircraft whatsoever, but there is some engine somewhere that burns or jet that burns this fuel. Okay, not just that, right? It's the whole infrastructure which aviation facilitates for us, the consumers. You know, we need to get to an airport. We need the infrastructure of an airport. We apparently love shopping in airports. We love all the plastic stuff and uh, accoutrements that go to providing services on board planes. It's all sorts of stuff that's part of that. And of course, then we want to go to a location which we wouldn't go to if we couldn't go by aviation. And some of the biodiversity and other carbon damage that's done by us, the tourists, 
using the services of aviation to go to far-flung parts of the world contributes to both to more climate change, but also to more biodiversity loss. So if you price carbon, and it doesn't matter where it's emitted, it doesn't matter if it's emitted in the agricultural sector, uh, transport sector, in aviation, in power sector, it doesn't matter where it's emitted. If you price all the carbon, then uh, at a rate which brings you within the frame of uh, a net zero carbon consumption basis, then you will crack the problem. And I put it to you, any other way of approaching this problem will be more expensive than that because it'll be subject to lobbying and all those interests. So the first point is polluter pays. And the polluter is you and me, and it means carbon pricing across the board implicitly or explicitly. Now, of course, aviation often says, well, you know, um, you've got the EU ETS, that's essentially a carbon price, but you know, we're up in the skies and we're in international space. And you know, part of the emissions are not for the, uh, the airport at Schiphol and the flight within the EU, they're outside, et cetera. And all that tells you is that aviation raises at the international level, the fact that this is a global problem. And the only way of tackling that is to uh, make it clear that the full carbon price will be applied at the border, unless the country at the other end of the flight has its own carbon pricing in place. And that's the beauty of carbon border adjustments. You know, think about it in a slightly easier case, but, but aviation is the same. Think about it as steel. You know, if we have a carbon tax on steel arriving in Rotterdam um, uh, at the port, as well as carbon produced in uh, uh, steel produced in Germany, the, the exporting country to the EU, let's say it's China, could be India, could be anywhere else, um, arrives at the port and says, well, you know, um, you've asked me to pay this uh, carbon border tax arriving here. Is there any way I can get out of it? Yes, you show me a certificate, an exemption certificate, that you had an equivalent carbon price at home. And, you know, the captain of, say, a Chinese ship, she might think to herself, well, you know, I bet my government would prefer me to pay that money to the Chinese government than they would uh, pay it to the Dutch government. And you see how this works out bottom up. By being unilateralist, which is what we've decided to do in Europe and in the UK, if we unilaterally apply the carbon price at the border, we create a massive incentive for countries exporting to us to have their carbon price as well, but as at home, in order to pay the money to their domestic government and not to the EU or the UK. And you're going to wrap this straight into aviation and apply a complete carbon border uh, price at uh, the border and ask the airlines in this particular case to come up with exemption certificates because they've been priced at the other end. Because you all know that if you price at one end and not at the other, this is gonna be very difficult to work through. And that's why the aviation industry has been so successful at fighting off paying the price of carbon. But you know, fundamentally in the end, you can't decarbonize the world without addressing aviation. If people want to fly in the future much more than they currently do, if people want new airports, new airlines, new destinations, more regular flights, et cetera, then it's gonna be a very long time before someone comes up with a technological solution globally, which really means that extra aviation comes with no additional carbon footprint. And that brings me to the final point on the aviation side. There are a lot of airlines running around saying, oh, well, don't worry about it. We'll do offsets, right? And you know, if you look around at the greenwash going around on about offsets and offset markets at the moment, you can see this is a, uh, I put it this way, a PR disaster waiting to happen, okay? When I'm told that if I get on aircraft, and say I don't anymore, but if I get on aircraft, if I pay, you know, two pound a ton or whatever into an offset frame, that that's all right, that my guilt is gone. I'm no longer responsible for emissions because they've been offset elsewhere. You have to ask some really serious questions. First of all, why are the offset airlines offering so cheap? That's the first question. Doesn't that lead to one to be somewhat suspicious about what's happening? Why are some of the projects that people are pursuing 
almost laughable in this context. I think one budget airline was offering, was saying that it would spend the money on a, a small bit of peat bog in Ireland and whale watching off the coast of Ireland. You know, this isn't serious. You know, this isn't, this isn't engagement with the fundamentals. But then you look to offsets themselves. The facts about climate change are we need both the offsets and the emissions reductions, not either or. Okay, now there's a good reason where there are hard to abate emissions for channeling the money into the sequestration side. Uh, but in doing that, there needs to be credible frameworks for pricing those carbon sequestrations, remembering they're going to be over a very long period of time, 25 years plus. Uh, they need capital maintenance to make sure if it's trees, they don't burn down, as happened in the US for the oil companies um, offsets. Um, the deer and the other animals, the squirrels and so on, don't eat them. And then, of course, at the end of the life, that timber must be uh, sequestrated and not simply burnt in power stations, as, for example, in the largest biomass plant, which apparently counts um, as a positive in carbon emissions, Drax, in uh, uh, the north of England. So there is a role for offsetting, but it isn't a get out of jail card. It's very badly done at the moment. It can be a contribution, but it remains the case. It won't get the aviation sector to where it needs to be. So that brings, brings us full circle. And that says, back to the comments by Peter, that you know, if you really do want to do more and more aviation, and that demand withstands much higher prices because of the carbon taxes applied, you have to believe that there are genuinely net zero technologies for aviation. And not in 10 or 20 years time or 30 years time, now. And that's of course the big problem because the capital stock in the aviation sector uh, lasts quite a long time. And there are virtually no major new uh, aircraft, et cetera, coming onto the system, which taken in the round are net zero and or, or close to low carbon. And in addition, you have to address all the what's called scope three emissions, which are all the ancillary pollution around the aviation sector. And so if the aviation sector is not to contract in a a uh, uh, decarbonizing world, it has to uh, really come up very quickly with very substantive technical changes, which are radical and transformational, and I don't rule those out. And it has to uh, be the case that people are prepared in the interim to pay much higher prices for uh, aviation. And in doing so, it has to be the case that the demand is simply that inelastic but higher prices will lead to an, a demand adjustment. And on the supply side, it is about technology. The great good news is the world isn't short of energy. The sun comes up every single day. It produces more energy in an hour than the entire world's electricity industries do in a year, roughly. So the thing that isn't the problem is a lack of energy, tons of it. The problem is a lack of harnessing that energy in a way which does not take us on the COP26 path, which is to well over 2.4 degrees warming. So in planning your own businesses, what you have to think about is, as it turns out that Glasgow hasn't delivered the goods, as the emissions carry on, and as particularly the parts per million in the atmosphere carry on, and as the global warming continues, because we're well over one degree already, what will the political reaction function be? Will politicians hunker down and say, well, you and me, we're the polluters, actually we like our cheap flights and we'll vote for MPs and, uh, and our representatives and parliaments who make sure that we get our cheap flights, even if they're polluting. And so, hey, if the governments aren't gonna do anything, why the hell should we? Or with other points along the way where the damage from climate change becomes sufficiently great that more draconian measures are necessary. But that's about the political economy, and that's a point that uh, Peter made early, earlier. But I'll, I'll stop at that point to leave time for people to uh, ask questions and hopefully show where I've got things wrong 
in my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dietrich. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I fully agree we need radical and transformational changes. And I take also your note that Glasgow hasn't delivered its goals. And I take that, that it's a call to governments to act. Uh, we have the chat here receiving many comments and many contributions from various people. So I think that uh, highlights how engaging uh, your uh, statement was. So I'm gonna be strolling up and I'm sorry, I hope I'm not gonna forget any of them. Uh, there has been some uh, comments related to sustainable aviation fuels. And I'm gonna try to find this. I'm very sorry, but you have received so many statements and so many comments. Um, okay. Um, so a point here is that uh, uh, SAF economics has at least three components, and we don't know much about these yet. Are there economies or these economies of scale regarding production of feedstock, economies of uh, SAF production from feedstock, and economies of uh, distribution? Uh, later, uh, has two components for uh, aviation, getting SAF to the airport. Currently, no use of um, currently no use of efficient pipelines and distributions of SAF on airport to the gate. So, will SAF have to be tacked to aircraft at the gate at higher cost? And overall, any comments that you have related to sustainable aviation fuels, Peter? Okay, so um, uh, our prime minister. Uh, in the UK, um, having used a, a private flight from uh, Rome to Glasgow, uh, took a private jet from Glasgow back to London to go to dinner with a journalist because he said his timetable is very busy and therefore he need to go by uh, air rather than um, uh, train. And I've said very little about, about regional solutions here. I've been mainly on the international side. And he said, it's not a problem. You can fly anywhere because we were using sustainable fuels. Okay, And that is a very serious response. Couldn't it be the case that the existing um, aviation industry just carries on and it just replaces straight fossil fuels with sustainable fuels? Yeah, and that's very attractive. So the question is, are there any sustainable fuels and how sustainable are the fuels that call themselves sustainable now? Okay. And this is not a straightforward calculation. You don't simply say, oh, it's biofuel, so it's all right. In the EU, we had the... Um, uh, sustainable uh, transport fuels, mainly not for aviation, but for other areas. And it turned out that more than half of it, I think 70% at one stage, was from palm oil. I think, well, of course it's sustainable, it's from nature, you know, it's great, sequestered it's stuff. And then you take a look at what happened to grow the palm oil, and you observe the destruction of the rainforest to produce it, and all the transport that goes with it. And you find out that it's probably better to burn oil, straight fossil fuel, than it is to burn palm oil. So the way you have to think about this is you look at the location where the fuel is produced. Synthetic's different, but, I, but on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on this particular case. And you have to do the baseline natural capitals of that site. Now, great, we've got satellite imagery. We can have a look at Malaysia, Thailand, or wherever it is. We can only see exactly what's there before you do this. Then we construct a counterfactual. What would have happened to that land if you'd left it, if you had not have done the palm oil. It might be that something worse would have happened, right? You might have turned it into extensive um, sugar cane or something and put loads of fertilizer on it. So it's not necessarily the case that it would have been worse, but it, it isn't the case. It's just going to be as it was before. Counterfactuals matter because this is a time horizon, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And indeed, if you destroy ancient rainforest forever. Okay. Then you have to look at the inputs to growing this stuff. Then you have to look at the processing that takes place. Then you have to look at the transportation that's involved. And when you add all this stuff together, what claim is tick the box, it's sustainable, isn't. And I mentioned Drax Power Station. You know, Drax Power Station is um, uh, um, uh, the largest contrib contributor to the renewables directive requirement within the EU till we left the EU, okay? It, turns trees or waste trees into wood pellets, dries them in, and then ships them to the coast, ships them across the Atlantic to the east coast of England, sticks them on a train, uh, takes them to the power station, cools them so they don't spontaneously combust, and then burns a low density energy 
in the power station with lots of PM 2.5s and other emissions, and it doesn't count, right? And that's exactly what you have to do here. So no biofuels are identical with any other biofuels. All of them have damage to other natural capitals associated with them, and therefore a blanket idea, it's okay, isn't okay. Now there's also the fuels involved in everyone getting to the airport and all those other component parts, et cetera, taking place. So yeah, these have a role, but then you look around the world, and look how much land there is, you look at the population, even if it's not gonna grow at the rate people thought a little while ago, going to 10 billion, in this century or nine and a half billion in this century, another two billion more people. You look at the agricultural needs and the land needs, and then you say, so have you got a space for biofuels and bioenergy as well? I think that's really highly questionable. So in some circumstances, fine, but that ain't the answer. Um, and therefore you have to look at some of these other technologies. And that's why Peter's right, that nothing is out there for the next decade or more, which looks like making much by way of contribution. And that leads to the conclusion that in the short run, the only thing you can act on is the demand side to get people to fly less until you've got flying, which isn't causing the damage, and then you can have people flying more. But the corollary of not being able to tackle the technology for over a decade is that flying now is more damaging than it's going to be in the future. The stock of carbon stays up there for 200 years. So you ought to be really curtailing aviation in the short run if that's what you want to do to address net, net zero. Thank you very much, teacher. And I think you brought up a very good example, palm oil. And I think that highlights that policy makers are learning, but they're learning slow. So now a uh, biofuel from palm oil has been banned and IAFA is not using that either. But Definitely, we need more research and uh, better policy so we can avoid those issues from the start. We have another question here from Brian Pierce. So he says, EU tried carbon border adjustment with emissions trading scheme in 2012 on flights outside EU. Failed as China stopped buying Airbus aircraft and US legal challenge. How can political economy be made to work? Okay, so um, I just want to say one other thing on the sustainable fuels in response to, to, to your comment. So people might say, well, we're not going to use um, palm oil now, okay? Notwithstanding the fact we've done fantastic damage getting to here, right? That damage is permanent. It's damaged the sequestration forever for the destruction of those rainforests, okay? So we'll try something else. We have to be very careful again. So let me give you an example of ethanol in um, uh, Brazil. Maybe not use navigation, but use as a fuel substitute. Okay. So what happens is the land area for growing the crops to produce this expands because there's a bigger demand. Okay. So then they push the cattle off the land, and then you clear the rainforest to keep the cattle, which you would have kept on the land that you had previously. You really have to think about the substitution effects because land is a fixed factor of production. And if you do one thing to land here, it's gonna have a consequence somewhere else. And that consequence somewhere else is part of the emission story that you're putting together. That's why I say no two bits of biofuel are identical. Not even palm oil is identical. Some palm oil is a lot better than others, okay? And I have no faith whatsoever in the uh, regulatory framework for doing this stuff, keeping pace with the damage to natural capital more generally being done. They'll always be playing catch up. Right, they'll catch up on palm oil, they'll have to catch up on the next one. So I think one has to be realistic about that. Now on the, we can't have a border tax because the Chinese won't buy our stuff. Right? Well, okay, so you don't want a border tax because you want to sell stuff to the Chinese, fine. Admit you're not really serious about climate change. Okay, these are the really hard trade-offs. Okay, if China can simply say, don't price pollution from our country, because if you do, we'll punish you. What you're really saying is China will carry on emission, emitting and they'll force you to carry on emitting too because you want to sell something else to them, right? And that's the crude reality of climate change. You know, if you look at, if you look at COP26, okay? So the Chinese and the Americans and the Indians blocked the phase out of coal. They, um, uh, uh, came into the methane story, okay? And um, they um, pushed their targets out further in the future, okay? So the question is, do you really think that what you might call playing softball, 
please, China, would you be nice to us? Would you just please help us reduce emissions? Is, is going to work. I mean, it isn't going to work. You have to realize the reality of where China is in this story, how they see this position, where they are on the development frame. You know, their consumption of, uh, um, uh, per head is much lower than, than, than the US, et cetera. Okay, we put all the stuff up there. Okay? So the question then comes, if you're going to always come up against, we won't sell you X, right? Then you're stuck. I'll give you another example, the, the EU deal with Brazil, right? It was called cars for cattle, right? Or cars for cows. You know, the Europeans wanted to sell cars to the Brazilians. So they say, fine, you can buy our cows on cleared Amazon land. Question is, what's your priority? And this comes back to, if you really believe you could decarbonize without any serious economic hits, you are genuinely on some other planet in the universe. Thanks, you very much, uh, Dieter. Again, the chat has many comments. <laughs> uh, you have been an independent chair of the Natural Capital Committee for a number of years, and you have been providing advice to governments. So as a final closing remark from your end, uh, me and also all the delegates will be very much interested to know what will you be advising the policymakers to do to tackle climate change? Okay, so um, you refer to the Natural Capital Committee and job done. Uh, we now have an Environment Act in Britain, which implements what we uh, propose to take forward. And we have an Agricultural Act to do that too. And um, although there are many, many detriments to Brexit, uh, being getting out of the common agricultural policy with all the pollution associated with that, and uh, being able to uh, set our own uh, biodiversity and other targets has been a small consolation for <laughs> all the other damage that's been done. So what should be done going forward? Well, my bottom line to ministers, and I say this continuously, is just tell them the truth. Right? Tell the voters that this is a massive challenge and it's going to cost them. Stop telling them what we call in Britain or the prime minister calls cakeism, that climate change can be addressed without any serious cost to people's standard of living. It's just nonsense. OK, and I just don't buy this idea that it's all going to be incredibly cheap and it's all going to increase GDP and consumption. We're all going to be better off. No, this is more like being in the 1930s in the UK with a peacetime economy and needing to fight the Battle of Britain in 1941 with a wartime economy. We have to go from an overwhelmingly carbon intensive set of economies worldwide to ones with virtually no carbon in a short period of time. Stop telling people that that's cheap. You know, the world is provided 80% by fossil fuels, right? Oil is nearly back until last week to 100 million barrels a day, right? And to get rid of all of that lot, or most of it within 29 or 30 years, well, that is a almost wartime effort, okay? If you tell the public that it's all cheap and free, they'll never vote for anything which is going to impose costs. And they'll tell you at the same time, they really care about climate change and they really want to do something about it. That's where we are. The public, um, after and COP had a big plus on this, the public in Europe, public in the UK, uh, the vast majority really think climate change is serious. Tick the box. Ask them if they want to spend an extra pound or euro per week. No, because they've been told it's free. So tell the truth first. Secondly, go for the low hanging fruit first. Okay, so we've focused overwhelmingly on the electricity supply industry and decarbonizing power. And we've got to do that. But it's much cheaper to decarbonize agriculture. Agriculture, I mean, in my country, agriculture is 0.5% of GDP, and almost all its output is provided by subsidies. Right? It would cost very little in economic output to change the nature of agriculture. Right? much less than it would take to change, for example, the characteristics of heating. And that comes to the next point. Politicians don't know, we don't know, what the best ways of decarbonizing are in the short term. We don't know the cheapest routes. Trust markets. Use the carbon price. Apply it to agriculture, transport, heating, aviation. Apply it to the energy sector. Do all of that and then let the market start to sort it out. That's the cheapest way you'll get to your outcome. And that's what I um, recommend to governments. 
And you must look at carbon consumption numbers, not carbon territorial production numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dieter. It's a bit sad that uh, you don't have confidence on regulators, but we don't blame you for that. I mean, they have been trying for a number of years to resolve the issues, and as it comes up strongly in the chat, not very successfully. Um, one other question is, uh, do you think that the cost benefit tool fit for purpose to tell us how much emissions reductions uh, are necessary? Is this a system wide issue rather than the magical, uh, the marginal change we economists usually look at? That's a really good question. And in my natural capital book and in my climate change uh, work, what I do is go to the heart of the problem for economists, which is cost benefit analysis applies on a project by project basis. So cost benefit analysis is about taking a discrete project, building an airport, right? Taking the rest of the world as constant, right? The natural environment comes in systems, ecosystems. It's no good talking about protecting 10 hectares of the Amazon rainforest. The rainforest is an environmental system as a whole. And the climate is a system. And so you get these laughable exercises done with um, uh, good intentions by economists trying to work out the marginal cost of a tonne of carbon and the uh, marginal benefits of reducing a tonne of carbon, and then they get to the optimal climate. Well, there's a good reason why we chose two degrees. Nobody thinks two degrees as a target is optimal. You've got to be, it's nonsense to think that. There's no calculation that will come to that, except if you deliberately distort it to produce that outcome. We choose two degrees because that was the best people thought people could achieve, right? And scientists will tell you that above two, three, things might be getting nonlinear and worse. So no, cost benefit analysis is not the right way to do this. And I go slightly further. In my approach to carbon pricing, I have a great belief in starting low and letting it adjust. So I want it comprehensive, but given the capital stock is given at any point in time, there's no point in having a high tax tomorrow morning. You want to credibly tell people that the tax will rise through time. And then you learn by taxing. I remember in this country when lead-free petrol was introduced and then the sulfur was addressed. Nobody predicted that the change in duties, fuel duties, would produce such a dramatic effect. It's because politicians don't know. They're just subject to lobbyists all the time. We don't know what the opportunities out there will be. We want to incentivize entrepreneurs, businesses to try out ideas. And we want to go because consumers can only stomach so much for those cheapest low hanging fruit first. But cost benefit analysis, it has its role, but in the environmental area, it can be uh, um, uh, of limited use and often it can be extremely misleading. Take a look at the cost benefit analysis studies for Heathrow Airport's third runway, and you'll see the limitations. Have a look at the cost benefit analysis for HS2. No, that's not the way to think about a system, especially a transport system. Thank you very much, Dieter. You have spent uh, most of your career doing research on sustainability and also looking at environment. So I'm personally wondering, and I'm sure that some of our delegates, with many of them being scholars, academics, and students, what do you think that the next steps for research and sustainable aviation should be? Okay, so I always start with the big picture within which aviation set. So most of my work at the moment is on what a sustainable economy would actually look like. Right? And that's a, uh, in, in itself, it's like asking a question like, what would net zero, what would our economy actually be like if we genuinely were sustaining it through time? It would be a growing economy, plenty of ideas, plenty of new technologies. It's not a kind of sort of socialist planned economy. It's an economy with markets, with prices, which reflect things, which people have incentives to react in particular ways. Okay. And the aviation industry is just one of those. It's full of surprises. Every industry is. How do we know what AI is going to do to uh, aviation? How do we know exactly how some of the technologies are being developed in a low carbon way for aviation are going to work? How do we know how transit systems are going to work on the ground? How do we know how the competitor systems in fast rail and other systems are or are not going to go forward? So I, I think that, that, that one thing economists should do is be humble and avoid saying, you know, this is the silver bullet. That's going to solve the problem. 
I believe that a sustainable economy is one where ideas and technology push out the frontiers. That's where growth comes from, greater prospects in the future, and where people are incentivized to do things. You know, I started my career with an Olympus portable typewriter, carbon paper, and Tipex doing my DPhil thesis. I now have in front of me a little computer, which is better than Oxford University's computer was when I started, the whole university. Right? That's technical change, utterly transformational in my lifetime. And that's, you know, 40 years of career. Well, just think what the potential out there actually is to crack this problem. So if I start gloomy about the way we're going, it's in order to get people to screech the brakes and say, this isn't going to work. But the other side of the gloomy prognosis is that the, the scope for opportunities, for ideas, technologies, applications is brilliant. And although government has to support R&D because it's a public good, the only way to incentivize markets, you and me doing our shopping, you and me choosing how to travel, to do the right thing to get to the sustainable economy is to make us pay the cost of our pollution. And then we'll choose some less polluting ways and that will signal to people supplying the stuff, including the people with the uh, airlines, et cetera, to find ways to make sure that I, as the customer, don't have to pay that high price because what you're supplying to me is low polluting. So huge opportunities out there. And you know, the great news is the speed of R&D, the speed of ideas, the speed of technical change has never in human history been faster than it is today. So the scope is fantastic. Um, I just don't want us to waste another 30 years down this blind alley of pretending that what goes on in the 26 cops so far is going to get us anywhere. And I don't think we've got 30 years to muck around again till we find something better in the future.